Thanks a lot, Michael. So uh, let, let me first apologize. Going from a PC to the Mac, some of the fonts may be uh, you know, twisted up a little bit. So it, it typically would look nicer than that. But I'm, I'm going to be talking about the economics of small-scale indoor mushroom cultivation today. And so two key words uh, within this is going to be small-scale and indoor. Um, small-scale mushroom cultivation uh, is, a, is a relatively um, easy thing to get into, which we'll talk about here in a bit, um, especially if we're talking about outdoor mushroom cultivation. And that's typically where most people start. Indoors is slightly more advanced. Uh, it requires uh, uh, various um, specialty rooms and things that we'll talk about here in a second. So my name is Steve Russell. As, as Michael mentioned, uh, we formed the Hoosier Mushroom Society about 10 years ago, and we still are active in that. Uh, the typical thing we do for the Hoosier Mushroom Society is take people out into the woods and identify mushrooms. Um, my current research interests are primarily around learning about Indiana's wild species. As I mentioned, we probably have three to 4,000 different species here in um, Indiana, and so I would say probably about half of them are currently undocumented. So every time you go out into the woods looking for wild mushrooms, there's a chance you're going to find something that's entirely new to science. Um, as a part of that, I also work with the North American Microflora Project. I'm a coordinator uh, for this project. And the goal is to do essentially what I'm doing in Indiana, trying to describe all the fungi that exist here and taking that uh, and looking at it towards the entire continent. Also a PhD student at Purdue University, which Michael mentioned. In 2015, I believe this book was released, The Essential Guide to Cultivating Mushrooms. Um, you can check it out on Amazon. Uh, it's really, I, I described this book as something that I wish existed when I first started cultivating mushrooms. And so it's really written for a beginner, somebody who's interested in just starting out from scratch and learning all of the techniques that are required um, in, in order to cultivate mushrooms. It's primarily focused around small scale cultivation. Uh, it, it doesn't really get into uh, what would be required for really large operations. And we'll talk about the distinction uh, between large and small scale here in a bit. And so indoor versus outdoor cultivation is the first distinction I want to make, and I'll, I'll talk about briefly. Um, I typically refer to indoor cultivation as kind of the gold standard. Um, when, when you're looking at uh, indoor cultivation, you're able to get predictable yields. You're able to have year-round harvests. Um, but there is a, 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 a lot of ongoing maintenance to indoor relative to outdoor. With outdoor mushroom cultivation, this is an example of shiitakes being cultivated on logs outdoors. It's a much easier process, much lower maintenance. I'll just quickly describe that process. You want to start off with four to six inch diameter logs, cut them in about two to four foot lengths, hydrate them. We actually used to use a pond at one point in time to hydrate logs. And then you drill and holes in, holes into in the log, log uh, every, every six, six inches or so going down it. And the hot picture in the middle there is something called the plug spawn. And so that's essentially that's the mushroom culture that you're going to be inoculating, be inoculating the logs with. And, and so, so you take a, take a rubber mallet or a hammer and hammer those spiral grid dowel pins and colonize the mushroom mycelium down into the logs. Seal them with cheese wax or cheese wax. And set them outside. So that nature doing things. And so that's the, so that the process, you know, there are a few more intricacies to it, but more or less, that's what the process is. is. All you're doing is cutting, cutting, uh, cutting logs, logs, drilling holes into them, inoculating them, them, and setting them outside, and letting nature do its thing. And so some, and so of, the some of the advantages of that is that it's really easy to start. Uh, there's no maintenance really once you get going. You know, if there's a long dry spell, you might want to add some water to it. You know, go water the logs, the logs are slightly hydrated. It's really low cost, and you generally have a high chance of success as a method. Some of the disadvantages, of the disadvantages um, to this um, outdoor, this outdoor method, method are typically takes a year, year before, before you get your first harvest. harvest. So, so if you, if you uh, uh, inoculate your logs in the spring, spring, it's often, it's often going to be, be the next spring, spring before you get before your first harvest. harvest. If you're lucky, if you're you, lucky might you might be able to get something in the fall, fall that wouldn't be guaranteed. So you know, a minimum of six months, but most likely it's going to be a year before you get your first harvest. Um, uh, secondarily, uh, secondarily, food things are going to on weather patterns. patterns. And so if you have so a long dry spell throughout the summer, summer as an example, you're not going to get any fruits. fruits. You're not going you're not to be able to know when your mushrooms are going to be coming up. I mean, one of the problems with mushrooms generally, especially when you get into larger scale operations, is the short shelf life. And so you have to have arrangements already in place with your restaurants, your grocery stores, wherever you are marketing your product. So that way, so when that way, the numbers do come, do come, you're able to efficiently get them out in the market. And ultimately, and ultimately, 
personally on the video videos. Um, you're, you're not, you're not, able, not able to know, know how, how much you're going to have it in one time. If you have a major fruiting and, and, and you have no place, place uh, to uh, uh, all of your, all of your uh, vendors are going to have it out, you're not going to be able to, you know, the mushroom might just go away if you haven't already gotten party for that. So those are some advantages and advantages to outdoor cultivation. Let me just read the some of the things that are commonly cultivated in both indoors and outdoors. So, so oysters, oysters, shiitake, shiitake. Um, um, most of you are probably, probably called those. those. Lions, 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 lions,
is that is that most most public don't know, know anything, anything about, about these mushrooms. mushrooms. And so, and so, and so, so if, if you have a nice mushroom, 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 set it out in the farmer's farmer's market, you're going to have to have as much education to your customers in order to sell these things. You know, just by just by having them, you're going to guarantee they're going to be sold. going to be sold. So so. Really, for really most, most of these more exotic, exotic mushroom mushrooms, education, education for your customer, your customer base, base is one of the primary, primary concerns that you have. You have. Let, me, let, me ask, let me ask, are there anyone, anyone, in, anyone in the room who grows mushrooms currently? Cool, cool. Test, 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 test. I think we're, I think we're back. back. So Mike, so Mike, Mike talking here in the woods, woods. another commonly cultivated species. Uh, once again, once again, once again you can grow indoors, indoors or outdoors. This one, this one takes, takes a little, little longer, longer than, than most of the other species grow. grow. Um, um, so that's, that's, that's going to be one of the considerations we'll, we'll, we'll mention here in a moment. How long how long it takes for these things to colonize into fruit. And so they don't all grow at the same rate. This takes probably at least a month longer than most other species. And also also reach the reach right up front. It's a medicinal, medicinal mushroom, mushroom, so not, so not, all, not all interested in interest. 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 mushroom, mushroom are, are um, um, focused, focused around, around, around edible species. species. Uh, the, uh, this, this one, this one, generally, generally might, might, might make slices. slices. It, 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 it's a, it's a more, dense more dense mushroom, mushroom. so people so might, people might slice it, make tea from it, and, and use it for medicinal properties. So there are a number of other medicinal mushrooms that can be cultivated as well. And Risha would definitely be one of the top candidates for that. So, so let me just let me just quickly quickly go over, go over this. I'm not going to put too much detail in it. Um, um, the main the main point here I want to make: growing mushrooms, growing mushrooms is going to be fundamentally, fundamentally different than growing, growing plants. plants. You have to you have to understand, understand some basic laboratory techniques, microbiology, microbiology techniques, understanding, understanding culturing, culturing, having having a culture lab, lab um, as, well as, as well as environmental, environmental conditions, conditions that you have to maintain. maintain are going to be far different, different than, than most than most people uh, typically, typically um, would, understand would understand just by using using plants as an analog. Um, the, um, the typical process is going to start off with a, a, a culture, culture of three mushrooms. Um, 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 Everyone knows mushrooms grow from spores. spores. That's, not, that's not the most common way, way that mushroom cultivators, cultivators would actually, would actually get, get their starting, starting cultures. Um, um, the easiest, easiest way, honestly, honestly you know, you know, if, if I was starting, starting a mushroom farm today, probably, probably what I would do is go to a grocery store, get some test, test, test. We'll go back to this one, maybe. Test, test, test. So you, so you, you, can, you can create a culture in any part, any part of, a of a mushroom. Okay, so, okay, so, so you can go to a grocery store, store pick up a shiitake, uh, the, 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 a strain, a strain and, that's been um, isolated, isolated and, and uh, is a high, high performing strain uh, coming, uh, from, coming from a major corporation. corporation. You can start, you can start off, off with one of their cultures, cultures and, and you know what, they, they, they taking one of their mushrooms and starting a culture directly from that mushroom. You're essentially getting a clone from a major corporation for free to your grocery store. You know, there, you know there, I, don't I, don't really I don't really see any ethical problems, problems with that. It's really common to, um, to do within the mushroom world. Um, but that, but that you know, saves, saves you a lot of time initially in developing your own strains that are high performing, that have fast, and that, and that sort of thing. Um, um, but, from there, but from there, the next, the next steps go into sterile, 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 uh, sterile cultures. So you, so you see a pressure cooker over to the left and then some jars over to the right. Sterile, sterile technique, technique is probably, is probably the primary reason why most people fail within mushroom cultivation. Um, just, um, just understanding, understanding what needs to be done uh, in, in this type of laboratory sterile setting, setting is, is, uh, is, is probably, probably the biggest challenge that most people face in getting, in getting into mushroom cultivation, cultivation and actually being successful with it. So from there, from there um, you, um, you can... Once you, once you expand your culture, your culture what's going on here is essentially you're expanding your culture from a single spore into a, into a petri dish, dish into, a into a quart jar, jar into, bags. into bags. Each of these, each of these tra each time you're transferring, transferring these cultures to a new substrate, substrate what your goal is, is primarily expanding, expanding your mushroom culture. culture. And so, and so the more mushrooms you want to grow, you have to be able to efficiently expand that spawn as much as, much as possible. And that's, and that's ultimately what you're doing, uh, ending up down in your in your pruning bags, uh, that are either straw, uh, things like straw or um, uh, sawdust blocks. So this, so this is a, sorry, so sorry it says a space and equipment is how it, how it should read. The, the, the overall uh, diagram here is just kind of a, a quick schematic of what a, a culture lab and incubation area might look like for mushrooms. Um, the, the lab itself, uh, I think this is about 
20, 20 by 20 in this diagram, so maybe 400 square feet. And so this, this would be for a slightly larger operation. Um, you, can you can definitely start a culture lab in a uh, walk-in closet as an example. It doesn't have to be a large space. A lot of people start off when they're growing at home, they just make use of, use of the space that they have available um, rather than having any type of dedicated space. Um, one, of, one of the key things I would mention here, though, is if you're trying to scale up a, a mushroom cultivation operation, you really want to have your lab separate from like the growing area and, and other areas. So if you have your lab close to your growing area, um, your growing area is where there's going to be a lot of contaminants floating around. You know, your atlas blocks tend to go bad. If your production blocks tend to go bad, they get moldy, uh, push lots of mold spores in the air. And that's going to be the primary thing that you're fighting to keep out of your laboratory area. You want your laboratory area to be as sterile as possible. I would also mention I'm kind of going through this, uh, you know, at a, at a nice pace, so that way there's going to be plenty of time for questions at the end. Usually for these types of talks, uh, there's a lot of questions. So if you have them, uh, we'll hold them to the end. There'll definitely be time for questions. Um, so an example of a culture lab, that would be an example of a petri dish uh, growing um, some mycelium. That's what a mushroom culture might look like. Ultimately taking from the petri dish and putting it into quart jars. Uh, that's rye grain uh, that's colonized by mushroom mycelium. And as a part of your lab, um, when you're first starting out with mushroom cultivation, as a part of your sterile technique, you're either going to need some type of uh, way to have a sterile environment. Uh, and there's two primary options that people use. On the right, it's called a glove box. So you might put all of your jars into this glove box, sterilize everything, seal it off on the top, so that way you're working in a, in a controlled, sterile environment. You know, you can make something like that for $20, $30, and that's probably how most people get started. As you begin to scale up with your culture lab, um, basically everybody moves to a structure like you would see on the left. Uh, it's called a flow hood, uh, is, is one term for it. Um, but it's essentially a HEPA filter on the front. Um, with a, a, a blower on the top that forces air down through it and out of the filter. What that does, what this machine does, is allows you to work in a sterile environment, um, more or less in the open air. So on the right, if you're using a glove box, you're going to be really constricted in terms of the total space that you have to work. If you need to include more stuff into your sterile working, into your working environment, you have to re-sterilize everything. And so it's just not as efficient um, of a process as it might be uh, to utilize a flow hood. And ultimately, going from those jars, you would generate some type of spawn. Um, on the left, you would see a sawdust block uh, going through the colonization phase. Uh, on the right would be an example of it fully colonized. Uh, spawn is just a term for a, a mushroom culture um, that's been expanded. And what you're looking at on the right uh, would be a possible end product that might go into the grow room. So you would, uh, want to, you would need to expand your culture to, to the point to where one of these sawdust blocks is fully colonized. Uh, for shiitake as an example, you would take that block out of that plastic bag at that point and then put it in your grow room. And that would be kind of the end result of your culturing process. One, one thing I would mention here is it is possible to buy pre-made spawn. So especially when you're starting out uh, within mushroom cultivation, you know, there's a, I just mentioned a lot of laboratory techniques and there are some expenses uh, in, involved in setting up your own lab and knowledge that you would have to build. What a lot of people do starting off is they would just go somewhere uh, and buy. There's a, a number of stores um, that you can have it shipped uh, to your home or business, and even, even a lot of businesses uh, will, will go buy spawn from a professional lab, so that way they can just skip the whole uh, laboratory process and learning the culture. The, the downside is it's going to be a lot more expensive. You know, you're going to have freight costs, which is going to eat up a whole lot of your profit. You know, you can buy these for relatively inexpensive, but if you have to buy them from Wisconsin or something like that, just the cost of getting these things to your operation is going to be substantial. And so you really have to take in the freight costs uh, as a primary component if you're trying to produce uh, mushrooms from purchase spawn uh, at, at a commercial level. Uh, one key aspect, uh, just kind of following up on the lab conditions, to get, to get to the point where you have spawn, you have to be able to efficiently sterilize your substrate. So if, the su um, if you put, take, uh, start with a mushroom culture and put it into a, a bag of grain or a bag of sawdust that's not sterilized, all you're going to get is a whole lot of green mold growing in the bag. And so one of the top concerns in terms of production output is essentially a function of how much spawn you can effic uh, efficiently sterilize. 
And so uh, on the left, you know, a really small scale operation, it is possible to sterilize things just in pots of boiling water, but that's going to be, you know, have a high, uh, have a very low success rate. Um, something more common is over on the right, it's a large pressure cooker. Uh, those you can fit about six production blocks in at a time, and so every round of sterilization uh, you would get six blocks. Some people might have, you know, four, six, eight of those types of pressure cookers going at any given time to uh, really help them uh, increase the amount of spawn that they can produce. Uh, if you were to really scale up, there are much larger pressure cookers that, you know, could be 16, 20 foot long. Uh, where you push entire carts into it. And so um, there was a guy down in uh, Paoli that had one of those at his farm. Um, but uh, th those are, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. You know, it, for especially for a small scale operation, that's just not going to be in the cards. After your culture area, uh, it, you need to have some type of incubation area. So after you, after you transfer your cultures into the bags, it's going to be several weeks. Uh, at least before you can move them on to the next process. And so these are just some examples of bags that are incubating on racks, getting ready to go into the next area. And finally, we have a, gr a growing area. So to make it as simple as possible, you know, just one of these four-tier greenhouses uh, can serve as a growing area. You can make it as elaborate as you want. You could add humidifiers and temperature sensors and all of that into this uh, type of setup. And I would say this is probably going to be the best place if people are interested in growing mushrooms to start. You know, you don't want to s try to start off with some really, really elaborate setup or a large room or something like that because it, it is going to be a lot of success and failure. You know, you, if you're wanting to just go into this as an endeavor and expect there to be no failure, you're not going to last very long in it. You're going to have to go through lots and lots of failure to learn what you're doing wrong, what you're doing right, and how to successfully grow mushrooms. It, it is, it's not a particularly complicated process. But it does take a lot of time and effort in order to learn the processes and understand how they function. As you scale up a little bit, you might do something like this. So, you know, dedicating an entire room to a, to a growing area um, with steel racks. These are oyster mushrooms growing on the left. Um, the obvious downside for something like this is you have to have the space. You know, if you have the space at your home, it becomes much more economical. But if you have to go rent a facility, that's going to be one of the biggest costs uh, in terms of producing mushrooms. And so, um, you know, something like this um, w would only really be in the cards after you've been growing mushrooms for an extended period of time. That's another picture of a lion's mane on the left. On the right, what you're looking at is shiitake blocks. As, as they start off white, um, after they fruit, um, this is a typical example of what they look like. They just turn completely brown. And this is what a, a growing area might look like a significant portion of the time. Uh, it's not quite as sexy as the, you know, nice mushrooms fruiting out everywhere, but, you know, after harvest, that's, uh, that's typically what a growing room might look like. So I would say, just starting to talk about economics for a little bit, they're fairly straightforward, I would say. There's not a whole lot of complexity to understanding uh, what would need to be done uh, to grow mushrooms. Uh, the first thing to consider are startup costs. We'll talk about a couple of those. Uh, how much space and other fixed, fixed costs do I have for production? And that's really going to be one of the primary drivers of how e economical uh, your particular operation is going to be. If you just want to start something small in your basement or your, you know, a spare room or something like that, that's totally possible and that really lowers um, your ov overhead in, in terms of producing mushrooms. And that's how most people um, are successful with mushroom cultivation is they already have a space. Uh, I would also mention here, you know, heating and cooling is going to be one of your primary space concerns. You can't just go start a mushroom operation out in a barn, you know, on your property here in Indiana, because we have really cold winters and really hot summers. It's going to take a whole lot of money to heat and cool that space uh, throughout the year. So that's it needs to be, um, you know, uh, roughly around 70 degrees consistent throughout uh, the year. And so he heating a barn or something like that quickly uh, takes the economics uh, way, way off the table. Uh, finally, the, the final two things are how, how much yield can I achieve and what price can I sell that for? And we'll talk about that in a second. So startup costs, some of the largest expenses. We talked about a flow hood. If you wanted to step up to that, you know, it, it, they're not that expensive. You can get one. Uh, you can make your own for probably $300. You can go out, out and buy one, five, six, seven hundred $700, depending on how much, how, how large of one you want, how, how big you want your operation to be. 
Uh, pressure cookers you can get for two or three hundred bu bucks a piece. And so that adds up pretty quickly if you're trying to do a whole lot. But it's not, uh, it's not some massive huge cost. Finally, your growing area setup, uh, th that can be achieved for a few hundred dollars. So the startup costs aren't uh, a deal breaker for most people in terms of getting into this either as a hobby or as an as a add-on to their small business. I would say the primary startup cost is the time and labor of getting experience in the process. So you're gonna have, as I mentioned, you're gonna have a whole lot of failures starting out. And you have to be able to diagnose why uh, you, you failed on an individual trial, and then take corrective action in order to get it right the next time. And that's gonna be a continual process. You know, you, you are gonna, uh, you know, uh, the first time you try growing mushrooms, you're probably gonna fail. The second time you try growing mushrooms, you might do a little better, but you're still probably gonna fail. The third time you might get some yield, but it's gonna be low. You know, you might actually get mushrooms and that's a very joyous day, but they are, probably aren't going to, you know, be very nice looking. You aren't going to have a good harvest. And so you have to be comfortable with that process, knowing going into this, you're probably going to have substantial failures throughout it. But, the, you know, the rewards, once you actually understand all of these processes involved, once you get the lab techniques down, once you understand how to maintain the growing environments, it becomes very, very easy. You know, then it's like clockwork. Once you uh, understand the organism, what they need to grow, and uh, just the process and place to do it. So I just wanted to emphasize that's probably going to be your largest startup cost, is just attaining the knowledge, you know, working through all of the issues that are involved with it, and uh, going on from there. So how, mu how much space do you have? Uh, I, I typically think about this in terms, like you might think about how retail stores look at their revenue potential. They often talk about, you know, how much revenue or profit can I generate per, per square foot of store? And so I, I typically think about a mushroom cultivation operation in much the same way, because you want to make the most efficient use of your space possible. If you have a very large room, as an example, that you have to maintain environmental conditions for, that you have to, you know, the, the, heat, the heat, the cooling, <laughs> for uh, when you're not making efficient use of that space, all that's just lost money. You know, it's just like heating an empty room. You know, it's gonna cost a lot of money to, to not have any kind of revenue being produced for that. And so making the most efficient use of your space is gonna be um, one, of the, one primary concern. And doing, doing it at home is the option that's typically uh, utilized for most people that I know uh, until they're really good cultivators and can start to scale. Uh, buying a dedicated facility I would say that's basically off the table for anybody starting off in mushrooms. Just don't do it. You know, you're going to fail if you try to do that. You need to start very small and work your way up uh, so you're comfortable with everything. And that, as you uh, start to grow, as you expand your market, uh, that, that's when you can start to think in terms of buying an actual facility. Um, the, the economics of this are going to be more or less how many blocks or bags can I make in the space that I have which we'll talk about here in a second, and what's the cost to make these? The other key variable is the yield. So just because you're able to successfully get mushrooms doesn't mean that you're going to have a profitable endeavor. So for any one of those blocks that I was showing, those production blocks where the mushrooms actually grow from, you know, you could expect anywhere from zero pounds of mushrooms to two pounds of mushrooms per block. And so if you're doing hundreds of these and trying to make a successful business of it, this becomes vitally important, um, what yield you're getting per block. And so there's a number of things. Um, one, of the, one of the key things to maximize your yield is what I would typically refer to as strain development. So you would start off with a particular culture of mushrooms. You would take it through the entire process. You would fruit that culture in, in your environment and see whether it's good or bad. So you actually might do that with a number of different strains starting out. So, you know, if you have 10 different cultures of mushrooms, uh, of sh shiitake as an example, from 10 different sources, or, you know, things, strains you've developed uh, coming from spores, or like if you're working with oyster mushrooms, you could go out into, into nature, you know, into the wild here in Indiana and start your cultivation endeavor from Indiana specific mushrooms. But the key point here is you would want to start off with a number of different strains and test them all out based on your own uh, environmental conditions. Uh, to see which ones colonize the fastest, begin fruiting the fastest, which ones yield the best. So it's not just about yield. Uh, there's, uh, you know, long times to colonize, long times for them to even initiate fruiting. 
that you want to take into account. And so it's really starting off, it's going to be a trial and error process as you're going through it to really try to develop the right strain uh, to be able to cultivate in a commercial capacity. And then once you get your yield, how much can you sell them for? So it's becoming more of an issue, I would say, these days uh, than it used to be. Um, shiitake as an example, every restaurant now can, from their major supplier, order shiitake. So it's becoming less of a novel product um, if you're trying to sell to restaurants or groceries. Most of the major mushroom farms out in Pennsylvania that do all the white button mushrooms, they also cultivate a number of these different varieties now. And so, you know, Indiana homegrown is, is going to be one of the top marketing points. Um, for your specific product and uh, what's going to allow you to have a, a premium. But honestly, not every restaurant cares about it. You know, if you're trying to sell your shiitakes for $10 a pound and they can go to their supplier and get it sub $5, you know, what makes more economical sense for that business? And so, you know, it's becoming more of a challenge, I would say. A, a wholesale, selling your shiitakes wholesale um, into, uh, you know, a distributor who's then distributing them to restaurants, you know, $5 is kind of a or used to be anyway, a reasonable number for local Indiana products. One other thing I would mention here, I guess, is that the market for these is not huge. So I was talking to one of the top suppliers of, of fresh produce here in Indiana a few years back, and they had suggested their total, um, you know, so let's say you were able to capture uh, all, of the, all of the business from this one supplier it would be about $100,000 in revenue a year. You know, that's revenue, to total revenue. And that's if you capture all of their business, which also includes parts of Chicago. And so that's just kind of the total market capacity for something like this. And so when you, especially in Indiana, if you're thinking about, you know, really trying to scale up and making hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of mushrooms or something like that, I would say you really need to understand the market uh, potential for the operation. You know, lots of people can, you know, grow smaller scales, sell at farmer's markets, sell locally. And I would say that's where most people are going to have success um, with mushroom cultivation because they're able to sell at a higher price and, and they just don't have to grow as much. You know, if you're sell, trying to sell wholesale, you're going to have to have big facilities. You're going to have huge startup costs. You're going to need one of those uh, giant pressure cookers I was talking about. They call them retorts, you know, that you could essentially walk into to sterilize your substrate. Th those are when the startup costs get really high, is if you were trying to do it uh, in, a, in a wholesale capacity. Uh, and it's, it's going to significantly decrease the price that you can sell individual mushrooms for. But at a farmer's market, $10, $15 a pound is somewhat common um, for shiitakes and especially some of the other species. If you were interested in, you know, kind of making it a significant portion of your income, Let's say you were an average cultivator, you're getting 1.5 pounds per bag, that's that middle row right there on the left. Let's say you were selling at a farmer's market, you know, getting, or a, a grocery store or wherever, and you were able to get $10 a pound. You know, that doing 200 bags per month, which is not, a, not an easy thing to do, you're only netting $30,000 in total revenue a year, 36,000. And then that's, that's total revenue, not even including any expenses. So if you're wanting to make it a significant portion of your income, you know, that 200 bags a month is probably going to be kind of the starting point. You know, if you're just looking to add, you know, five or $10,000 uh, to your overall, um, you know, farmer's market returns, you know, you definitely wouldn't need to go to the scale. But if you're really trying to scale it up, I mean, you really probably need to get to about this level um, in order to make it, you know, actually bring in some real income. So, you know, remember here, we're talking $36,000 a year in total revenue. Um, at 200 bags a month, and, which is not an easy thing to accomplish. And so the, the biggest expenses that you need to subtract from that aren't the bag production. So if you're talking about those sawdust production blocks that I, was, uh, I showed you guys, those maybe run 50 to 60 cents a bag depending on how you source all of your products. You know, that's not going to be your major concern uh, in, in terms of manufacturing them. You know, some things like rye grain, it's going to be marginal, you know, $50 a year or something if you have 200, uh, if you're doing 200 bags a year. Uh, wheat bran is another additive uh, that's marginal. Propane, natural gas, um, in order to uh, power the pressure cookers 
or if, especially a larger scale if you're using a retort, you're going to need some type of uh, fuel, whether it's electricity or um, propane, that's going to be a, a, another major expense. You know, I'm putting up there 17 cents a bag if, it, if, you're, do, if you're buying it wholesale. Um, but if you're buying it retail, you know, going to a gas station or something and utilizing those small propane tanks, it's going to be far more expensive. One of the, one of the key inputs is going to be sawdust. Um, for, and this is going to be true for most of the mushrooms I've talked about so far. So whether it's shiitake, whether it's uh, lion's mane, or oysters you can grow from sawdust, that's going to be one of the, uh, the primary inputs that you're going to need to have lots of and a consistent supply of. Um, so a couple things I would mention here. D down in southern Indiana, there's a whole lot of sawmills, and it's not too difficult to be able to talk with them and to get uh, supplies of sawdust that are coming out uh, from their facilities. It's probably going to be more difficult in northern Indiana where there's far less of a, of a logging industry. The second concern with sawdust is what species of trees are actually being um, hewn or whatever they do <laughs> at a sawmill. You know, so, especially, so let me take one step back. With outdoor cultivation, you're typically going to want the densest hardwoods that you can find. So something like an oak. You know, that's going to be ideal for your outdoor cultivation efforts because it takes a lot longer for that, those oak trees due to the density to decompose into nothing. The longer you can keep your outdoor logs from decomposing, the more harvests you're going to get, the more years those logs are going to last. The opposite is going to be true for indoor cultivation. If you're utilizing primarily oak sawdust for your cultivation efforts, what's going to happen? It's going to take longer to colonize, it's going to take longer to fruit, and ultimately you probably won't get many additional harvests out of that. So something like a tulip tree a, um, is a much less dense wood for indoor cultivation efforts, and so that, that's going to colonize faster and fruit faster than if you were trying to grow indoors with something like oak. But a consistent supply of sawdust is going to be a primary concern if you're trying to cultivate mushrooms. You know, where do you acquire, we used to buy it in truckloads, you know, we'd have a uh, dump truck come in from the sawmill, dump it in a big pile outside, and, and that's how we would get it. But that's not going to be possible in every part of the state to be able to find that source. And even if you did, once again, you're looking at large transportation costs. If, you know, uh, for a relatively inexpensive product like sawdust, most of your cost is going to be in the transportation to your actual facility. Any questions there? Offhand? Yeah. Yeah, so most hardwoods are going to work. So it's, it's not like you have to, so, so I would say anything pine I would avoid, or cedar, or you know, some of the more aromatic woods. A mix of different varieties of sawdust is perfectly fine. You know, sometimes you just have to go with what is available, you know. Um, where, uh, down in southern Indiana, I would just have it, uh, you know, a, a um, sawmill on call telling them, hey, whenever you guys are primary, you know, doing a large thing of tulip tree, let me get that sawdust, you know? And so it would, you just kind of would have to kind of take it whenever it was available, if that's what you wanted. But most of the time, if you need it, it's just going to be a mix of various hardwoods. And so the main thing is to not have it be, you know, pines or various other aromatic woods. So in terms of a production schedule, you know, if you really want to get, in, get into this at a commercial level, you have to think in terms of how consistently can I generate product for the people that are buying it from me. And so that's going to involve a fairly consistent production schedule um, that you're going to have to maintain. And it's a lot of work. There's lots of things you have to do every week. You have to maintain your growing environment every day. You know? It's not like outdoors where you can just throw stuff out into the woods and forget about it for months at a time. You know, if you're working indoor cultivation, you, every day you're going to be doing things. You're going to be harvesting mushrooms. You're going to be checking your environmental controls. You're going to be making new jars, doing lab work, making new petri dishes. You know, you're, you're good. there's going to be a whole lot of various aspects that you're going to have to do pretty much on a daily basis and especially on a weekly basis. But just look at the time frames here. So if you, if you were to start uh, that first column, jars prep, you know, it takes about two weeks for those jars to colonize. After that, it takes about two more weeks for your bags to colonize. So if you're, this is just, there's a number of different pathways you could follow through. Um, this is going to go from bags to what's called sawdust spawn, uh, finally into production blocks. But every, every time you transfer that culture, it's going to take about two weeks for it to occur. 
you know, to be fully colonized so you can use it in the next step of the process. And so if you're looking at, you know, let's say you started today with a culture that you already knew was good, you know, something that's worthy of a commercial cultivation attempts, it's going to take at least 13 weeks before you're able to even put it in the growing area. And then after you put it in the growing area, it's going to take a couple more weeks to fruit. So you're looking at your very first fruits about 15 weeks after you start the entire process. And then you're looking at about 21 weeks for that first block that you put in to actually finish. And so the time frames to get all of this achieved, you know, you can't just start and stop uh, this process. If you don't have this type of steady production schedule, it could easily be months you know, uh, of a gap between when you have a new product and when you have your old product. So you can't think about it in terms of, I'm going to let this batch grow and then start a new batch, because there's going to be months long gaps in your ability to su supply your suppliers. And so that's kind of the, the main point here. And then as you scale up, obviously there's all, all kinds of other costs to consider that I'm not going to go into, you know, things like lab consumables, building costs, uh, electric taxes, delivery, you know, that, and that can be actually, delivery can be a pretty big one. If your model is selling to restaurants, how are they going to get, how are you going to get the product to those restaurants? You know, there's going to be a lot of transportation costs that are involved in that. You might need part-time labor, health insurance is definitely something to think about kicking into this mix. And so, you know, I, I would say the m most likely source of failure in this process overall are, is contamination, without question. People start this, their pro projects get contaminated, and then they're just like, screw it. <laughs> you know, I'm, it, it gets them so aggravated because they put all of this work into it, they've spent months trying to get this thing right, and then it ends in a big pile of green mold. You know, that, that's why most people quit and why most people don't stick with it. But, you know, with, with dedication, and that's really why I wanted to emphasize that point in particular, it's totally achievable for everybody. But you have to be prepared for those kind of setbacks if you're looking to get into mushroom cultivation. Um, failure of environmental controls is, is, an, is another reason, or improperly placed environmental controls. If your humidity doesn't maintain in the growing area, as, as an example, it's really going to depress your yields. Um, and just a general lack of maintenance. This is something, especially for indoor cultivation, it's going to be a daily endeavor. You know, you have to, this is something you're going to have to check on day in and day out if you're trying to grow mushrooms uh, commercially. The final thing I already mentioned at the beginning, but the short shelf life is the final concern. And so if you want to get into this, you really have to have your suppliers ready to purchase from you as the mushrooms are available. You know, we're, we're only talking like a week or so um, before you need, you know, from the time they're harvested to the time they need to be out of your facility. That, that would be like the max. Because you also have to think about, let's say you're selling to a grocery. The grocer needs shelf life within their store for the customer to be able to buy it. You know, and so the total shelf life for the mushrooms is relatively short to begin with, and so you have to get them to, to your end supplier as quickly as possible. So if you're thinking about getting into commercial cultivation, I would say it's totally a, a, an achievable endeavor, really for anybody of any skill level, but it is going to take dedication, it's going to take learning. It's, you know, looking at how plants grow is not an analogous situation to how mushrooms grow. You're going to have to learn an entirely new process, a new life cycle of an organism, but it's definitely achievable. I, I would say the book that I mentioned up right up front is a pretty good place to start. It's going to cover basically all of the techniques that you'll need in order to um, achieve your goal uh, if you're interested in growing mushrooms. Um, I, I would definitely also recommend starting as a small side project. And so don't just try to jump into it at any type of scale because you, I guarantee you will fail. You know, it's just not, it's not going to be successful. Start off small learn the life cycle, learn everything that needs to occur uh, to get these things uh, growing and functional and to get good yields, and then slowly scale up. And also scale up with your market. So, you know, you're, you're going to need to uh, de be developing your market at the same time that you're developing your capacity to grow more mushrooms. So with that, I think I'm going to open it up to questions, uh, if anyone has any. Yep. Yeah, so there's literally hundreds of different types of media that would work within a petri dish for cultivation. Uh, the most common are something called MEA or PDA, so potato dextrose agar or malt extract agar. That would be the most common. Um, but 
You can use things like cornmeal or dog food or, you know, there's uh, literally hundreds of types of mycological media uh, that you could utilize. Yeah, so, you know, the typical process for that would be you make up your mixture, um, put it in some type of flask, um, put it in a pressure cooker, pressure cook it for 30 minutes or something like that, and in front of your flow hood or your glove box under sterile conditions, you would pour it into those plates. It takes about 15 minutes for it to cool after you pour it. So it's a relatively simple process, but you do have to have some of those basic lab skills if you're looking to make your own media. Once again, you could get online and buy pre-made media, uh, to, that comes to you, and so that's that's another option. Yeah, I say, if there's something to be said, I, I visited a lot of the mushroom houses in Pennsylvania mm -hmm. and visited a couple of the large shiitake production yep. spots, and they're buying pre-inoculated substrates from China. They're importing them from China, throwing out massive infrastructure that's been there since like World War One. Mm -hmm. So there's no capitalization there. It's just they yep. own I wouldn't say that's universally true. I, I would say uh, there, so. There's a, a lot. So even in Indiana, there's a, play, a place called Sylvan Spawn, maybe. So there's actually spawn being produced here in Indiana. Um, you know, that's being sold to some of those larger operations. The, uh, yeah. So uh, the economics are very difficult for a small scale person to buy spawn from China. If they're buying spawn in you know 40 foot containers and that's how it's arriving at their facility, that's the only thing that makes it economical to be, for them to be able to buy spawn from overseas. So, you know, that's just not gonna be in the cards for most people. But just seeing how they focus on the production. Yeah. Yeah, I would say that's, just, that's gonna be different between different companies. Some companies pride themselves in maintaining their own cultures in, you know, uh, uh, pr you know, producing their own spawn, and most of the companies that do that also sell their own spawn to other people, so. That's, yeah, yeah, there are a number of options in terms of purchasing spawn, but yeah, especially for, for, for those larger operations have lots of economies of scale, and that's why they're able to produce things at such a much, you know, a much lower cost and, and to sell them at a much lower cost than it's going to be achievable for most small farms. Yep. Yeah, so there, there's going to be, that, that's just going to be, so like if you got my book as an example, it would list within all of the different steps. Um, you know, if you're doing a grain transfer as an example, it would list out the likely sources of contamination. Um, but yeah, diagnosing that is just, just by working with the organisms over time, you know, seeing where the contamination starts in a jar. Uh, so if you have, let's just use the jar as an example, if you see a little spot of contamination on the side of the jar, you might guess that it's going to be a sterilization problem. So there might have been a mold spore that wasn't uh, properly killed in it. Versus if there was mold appearing all over the jar, it was probably an inoculant contaminant, you know, something that you mixed all throughout it. And so those are the kind of intricacies that, you know, just by working with the organism over, over the course of time, that you'll be able to get an understanding of the likely sources of, of contamination. But yeah, if you get online, you know, there's plenty of groups that, you know, if you posted a picture, people could help you diagnose uh, the sources of the different problems. Yep. So, it, yeah, it, if you use like a basement as an example that maintains a relatively consistent temperature throughout the year, you know, that would be a good way to lower environmental costs. Um, you know, what I would avoid probably is just like an external um, uninsulated structure. You know, that's just not even going to be a good starting point. And so it depends on what, obviously it depends on what scale you're going to want to do it at. But if you're just wanting to start off small scale, using like a spare bedroom or a closet or something to that effect, you're already maintaining the environmental conditions for your home. And so there's just not going to be much additional cost associated with it. Uh, as you scale up, obviously there's you know, a bedroom doesn't work quite as well. Or your wife doesn't want <laughs> all of this mushroom stuff in the house all the time, which has been a consistent issue in my life. Yep. Mm. 
Yeah, so it depends on the structure of the basement. So I actually used a basement once where it was a stone floor, like a concrete floor, and so that worked out really nicely. So you would essentially be creating a structure using plastic, uh, creating a subroom within your basement, and so all of the moisture should be trapped within that environment, and so it wouldn't be a concern. But obviously, if you have a carpeted basement or something like that, it's just not going to work as well. And so it really depends on the unique qualities of your, your location about what might be possible. We do have about five more minutes for questions. Yeah. Are there any particular food safety issues with producing mushrooms that they don't Yeah, I would say gen generally not. So mo most of the time a mushroom becomes like infected with a virus or a bacteria or something like that. There's going to be physiological symptoms of the mushroom. It's going to become slimy. It's going to you know, exhibit abnormal growth. And those types of things are really easy to diagnose just by looking at them. Um, systematically, there aren't very many problems in terms of, you know, uh, you know, bacteria being on a growing mushroom that's been given to farmer's market. Yeah. Yeah, people definitely do that, and that's, that would definitely be a, a possible option. So yeah, I mean, you can convert almost any type of structure that you have to mushroom cultivation, you know. It, and it, even if you only did it for a certain portion of the year to where you didn't have to maintain those environmental variables, you know, if you started off uh, a few months prior to um, when you're looking to grow, you know, just kind of getting that production schedule in place so your end, end results are ready to go in when that period of the year starts, that's something a number of people do. That way you don't have to worry as much about maintaining those, you know, heating in the winter or something like that, which is going to be a massive cost. Yep. <coughs> Yeah, uh, that's so. The 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 amount of the total amount of surface area in your growing room for um, that has the potential to fruit is what you want to maximize. Um, you know, the mushrooms will fruit on all sides of that block, even underneath it, and that's another reason to use like the wire racks rather than you know the just like a wood plank or something like that. It just increases that surface area more, which gives you more potential to have more yield. Well, I thank you guys for coming. I hope you enjoyed the talk. And uh, I'll be doing the next talk as well, and it's going to focus on harvesting wild Indiana mushrooms.